This is the 41st time the Yankees have gone to the World Series. This is the 22nd time the Dodgers have gone their second all-time to the Yankees. All right, let's bring in our next guest, ESPN's Tim Kirkchin. Joining us right now as we preview the series and we do some looking back here um, on a big Monday, as we know what the World Series looks like. But we have a few days to kind of let it all kind of sink in. Tim, great to have you on. Do you like this? So I know that this was the first year that Major League Baseball said, hey, if we have only a five-game series on both sides, we will start this World Series on a Tuesday. We ended up having that one extra game that gets us to Friday. I like it as a media member because we get to really talk it up like it's the Super Bowl for the next few days. I would rather start as quickly as possible because we lose momentum when we don't play a game from Sunday until Friday. That's what I would do. However, I'm not a player. I don't have to fly across the country and get ready for a game in one day. And the extra rest does allow both teams to get their pitching set. It allows their players to get rested, which I think is critical. I just hate to lose the momentum that we're not going to have a game on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, or Thursday leading up to the World Series. However, this World Series is going to be so good, so special. Maybe we do need four days to give it its proper due. Hey, Tim, it's it's your guy, Cam Maven. My friend, I want to ask you, as we talk about uh, the Dodgers bullpen, you know, one thing I was really impressed with, the guys that they ran out of the bullpen, Phillips, uh, uh, Kopech, Hudson, Trinan. I know they've been banged up, but I feel like when you look at the stuff that they have in the bullpen uh, compared to the Yankees stuff in the bullpen, but the Yankees, I feel like, have the edge as far as the starting rotation goes. How do you see this playing up, and do you see an edge from either pitching staff? Because – the Dodgers have, I think, the guys with the more nastier stuff when you look at it. What do you, what do you see there? I do. That nasty stuff in that Dodger bullpen cannot be underestimated. Trying that ball, diving, and Phillips' slider is ridiculously good. They have really good stuff out of that bullpen. But I will tell you, fellas, I just finished doing the Yankees against the Royals and the Yankees against the Guardians, and their bullpen is pretty darn good also. It carried that team until Judge and everybody else really started to hit. Luke Weaver, fellas, you know this. When he's right, he's not good. He's great. He was tremendous. That changeup and 96 miles an hour has changed the way that people look at him. I mean, Lane Thomas told me he faced um, Luke Weaver when Weaver was in Cincinnati. And then he saw him again in this series and he went, who is that guy? He doesn't look anything. He doesn't throw anything like the guy that I saw before. Plus Clay Holmes who did give up a big hit the other day had gone 14 innings without allowing a run in his postseason career. Um, Jake Cousins was really good the other night. I like that Yankee bullpen. And Eric, you need to explain this to me, please. Tommy Canely threw 48 consecutive change-ups, and he got away with it. I know it's a great change-up. I know he's got 95 in his back pocket. I know he has different arm action. But you, the catcher, explain to me how a guy can throw 48 straight change-ups and be as good as he was. Well, now all the buttons. We don't, we don't, we don't give this anymore. So, so – Austin Wells, he was just like, he just kept touching every button, every button, just change up. He's like, oh, okay, change up. He just completely got rid of all the other buttons. And it just, as a catcher, when a guy's on a run like that, you're thinking the whole time, you're like, no chance. No chance I'm going to call this again. You're like, oop, change up. And then at one point, you're like, I'm going to go change up again. But the one thing you don't want to do is you don't want to screw it up. Because you throw, you call a fastball, and he gets whacked. You're the one that screwed it up. Because I know Austin Wells is in there, and he's getting chatter in his ear from Matt Blake going, this, this pitch is a 90% pitch. And Austin Wells is like, screw it. I'm going 100%. Right. It's so funny. Brad Osmus, the bench coach for the Yankees, former catcher, of course, he looked at me the other day and he said, I told Tommy that he's tipping his pitches. 
because every time he gets on the rubber, I know he's going to throw a change up. That's how but he gets people out with it. It is just fascinating to see how this works. I told Tommy, I've never seen anybody do that. And he goes, well, neither have I. That's how odd this is. But as long as it works, works. He told me he shook off the catcher twice during those 48, looking to throw a slider or something. And he shook him off and said, no, I'm throwing another changeup. Yeah, so Austin Austin was accused of screwing it up then. He tried to screw it up by calling a fastball. And that pitch, the pitch is nasty. It really is. It's a unique pitch from an analytical standpoint, all that stuff. What does this series mean for baseball? Two of the most popular teams, East Coast, West Coast, everybody killer. Like it's there's so many, there's so many boxes. Thank you, Cam, for understanding that that line that I just used. But I got you. <laughs> what does this Look, mean for baseball? This means this is huge for baseball. There's no way around this. This is the greatest October uh, rivalry that baseball has ever seen. This is the 41st time the Yankees have gone to the World Series. This is the 22nd time the Dodgers have gone their second all time to the Yankees. This is the 12th time they'll be playing. That is a major league record. And we started this in 1941, Dodgers, Yankees in the World Series. And we, we finished in 1981. So it has been a really long time. We've got two 50 home run hitters, one on each team in the World Series for the first time. We have five former MVPs playing in this World Series, and basically all five are essentially in the prime of their career. We have the most remarkable player we've ever seen in Shohei Otani, who's going to win the MVP unanimously this year. We've got Aaron Judge, who's like no other player who's ever played the game. No one this big has ever been this good, really not even close. So we got the two biggest stars in the game. I think we have the three best hitters in the game with Soto, Judge, and Otani. I'm not sure how this series can, can miss. It, it Dodgers, Yankees, it's as good as it can possibly get. Well, Tim, you lead me into this next question perfectly with that. You talk about how star-studded this game is. Uh, not just the stars, the, su the supporting cast. These guys are great players. When you look at these two lineups, you look at the Yankees, they pretty much ran out the same lineup every game this postseason, barring a couple, moving a couple guys around. You know, the Dodgers, they're going to mix and match like they do. Which lineup do you see having the advantage when going into this series with all the talent out there? Well, I think the Dodgers are slightly better. They just finished – an NLCS where they scored 46 runs in six games. That's the most runs ever scored in an LCS. That's how good the Dodgers were. Now, Freddie Freeman, of course, has to be 100%, which he's not, for the Dodgers to have a better lineup than that of the Yankees. But th this is the beauty, fellas, is that the, Yan the Dodger lineup is so loaded with all those guys and Tommy Edmond got 11 hits and drove in 11 runs in the LCS. I mean, that's unbelievable. This is why baseball is the greatest game in the world. That's like Steve Kerr outscoring Pippen and Jordan on the Bulls in, in the championship series. Steve Kerr was great, but it can't happen. Your best players always carry the load in basketball. But in baseball, Tommy Edmond, who's a really good player, don't get me wrong, 11 hits and 11 RBI. So I love the Dodger lineup. The Dodger lineup has hit its way through any sort of pitching issues the Dodgers have. Mm -hmm. But I'm telling you, fellas, I just saw the Yankees play eight games in a row, nine games in a row. And, and Juan Soto's the best hitter in baseball. Judge is really starting to swing it. And Giancarlo Stanton is one of the great postseason players ever. There is no way around this now. He's got 16 home runs in his postseason career. Only Babe Ruth has a higher home run per at-bat ratio in the history of the game. And he hit some balls in those series that I just went, oh my God, I can't believe, I can't believe he did that. But I can because of how strong he is. Okay, so you hit on exactly what I was going to ask. Is there anybody... Have you ever seen anybody or in the history of baseball, anybody like G? But I'll more twist it this way. Has there ever been anybody that's like kind of, you know, not even sure if he's going to play in the regular season because of injuries and stuff, and then in the postseason just become 
this legendary status. Yeah, I'm not sure. I asked Aaron Boone this. I said, you need to explain to me how Giancarlo Stanton can be a pretty average hitter, a pretty easy out on a Tuesday night in June. And then October comes and he becomes Babe Ruth all of a sudden. And Booney just looked at me and he said, look, he loves the lights and he loves the noise. And and that that's the only way to explain how dominant he's been. But fellas, this is how good the Yankee lineup is. The, the home run that Judge hit off Emmanuel Classe. You guys know the pitch I'm talking about. He hits a laser shot, a four iron over the right center field fence. After the game, Stephen Vogt told me, Judge is the only player in baseball that can hit that pitch out for a home run. So I relay this to Aaron Boone and he goes, well, there's someone else who could do that. That's the guy hitting after Judge, who is Stanton. And then Booney pauses and he goes, and the guy hitting before Judge could do that in Soto. So there are three guys in their lineup that are just so devastatingly good right now that if they swing it this way in the World Series, the Dodgers obviously will have their hands full. All right, so much recency bias, but I have to get your instant reaction. Is Giancarlo Stanton a Hall of Famer? Uh <laughs> Well, with the postseason <laughs> record, I, I think he's going to have to get to 500 home runs to make the Hall of Fame. I don't, geez, I haven't even done this research. I don't think he's a Hall of Famer right now. Career batting average, not what a career batting average should be for a Hall of Famer. Um, and strikeout rate, you know, he's got 34 strikeout games in his career. 30. Um and but he's he's certainly making a case for him. And when you add in, my guess is he will be a Hall of Famer when he retires. But at the moment, I don't think you can go there. OK, and he's at 429. So you figure he's got at least a few seasons left, even if they're injury marred. I mean, he's likely to get to 500. Oh, right he'll get to 500. Yeah. I'm sure of that because he's still he's still unbelievably strong. Yeah, he is. All right, so I, I got one more that I want to throw in there um, that we have not brought up for the first hour and a half of our show on the Yankees. Glaber Torres and the job that he's done in the leadoff spot has made him, I think, the fourth name that you have to include with this group right now. It's Soto, Judge, Stanton, and I'm like, Glaber has been so consistent this postseason. So the question for you is, what are we seeing differently from him and how much money is he making himself? You always see that one player who bursts out in October. We've known about him for a while, but this is huge for, I think, the next team he lands with if it's not the Yankees. Right. He's already made a ton of extra money in free agency with what he's done so far. Fellas, you know we started, there were points of this season where we thought this is a two-man team. This is Judge and Soto. Well, now it's a three-man team when you add Stanton in there and others, but it's definitely one through four now with Glaber Torres. He has been a really good offensive player for the last two and a half months since they inserted him back in the leadoff spot. Remember, he was the leadoff guy to start the season. But when he hit the slump, Booney took him out of the leadoff spot, then put him back in there. And the only guy who has had a higher on-base percentage out of the leadoff spot since, since Glaber was reinstalled there is Shohei Otani. That's how good he's been. And he got some huge hits against the Royals and some even bigger hits against the Guardians. I think he got eight hits in the first inning of the playoff game so far, and that's an awful lot. Yeah, yeah, he is making himself some good money. Um, all right, I, I got one follow-up for you on the bullpen conversation that you were going over earlier with the Dodgers and the Yankees. I mean, you get talk from the non-Dodger Yankee fans and just, you know, fans that are so passionate about their clubs that they're a little pissed off to see a matchup like this, even though I mentioned at the top of the show, this, it's not like we get this every year, right? This isn't the NBA where you get a super team, they keep going back to the finals over and over again. So we get a lot of variety. I don't know why someone would complain. It's not like we get Yankees Dodgers all the time. But what is your answer to fans who say, you know, the way that the game is constructed right now is unfair where these teams can get all of these big players and now they both land in the World Series? One of the counters I think that should be made is how they put their bullpens together. 
Mark Leiter Jr., Jake Cousins, um, Tim Hill. Actually, two of the three names I just mentioned came from the White Sox, Tim. So I don't know what your answer is, if anyone mentions that, and also just how you think they've been able to construct these bullpens because these aren't like many of these guys are not big money pitchers. Right. Look, I, I can, you can't argue with the average fan or any fan who says this isn't right that the, the guardians, you know, uh, payroll is X and the Yankees is five times that or whatever it is. There, there's no way to argue that The, the fans are right about that, but Scott, you're right. Also building a bullpen is absolutely critical and it doesn't have, you don't have to go get, you know, a $25 million a year closer mixing and matching with with cousins and hill and ian hamilton and the way they put that together you know it has really really worked out and i am convinced davy johnson convinced me of this years ago you win in october with a deep versatile bullpen now more than ever and that's what the yankees have because i watched it work and if you don't overwork them that's a pretty darn good system and look some of these small market teams have won lately so it's not that the big market teams win every year if you're a small market team and you build your team properly you can win how we always we always evaluate players you know play during this time of year how would you evaluate Stephen Vogt the rookie manager his managing during this postseason well, I think he's done a great job. I talked to the Guardians guys, and granted, they're biased. He's their guy. But he went toe-to-toe, they told me, with A.J. Hinch. And Joey Cora of the Tigers told me in that series that A.J. Hinch is the best strategist, the best game manager in baseball today. And he's not just the best today. Joey told me he's the best I've ever seen. And I would, it's hard to disagree that he's the best game strategist today. And I'm told by the Guardians guys that Stephen Vogt was with him every step of the way. Now, did he do a perfect job against the Yankees? No, but it's hard to do that in the postseason. I think Aaron Boone made all of the right moves, virtually all of the right moves. But there's no way around this. Stephen Vogt is going to be the manager of the year in the American League. He's going to deserve it for the way he kept that team together. Fellas, they had a 50 and 57 record out of their starting rotation with a 440 ERA and they won 92 games. That's really hard to do. And let's be let's be honest here. They had three really good offensive players, Stephen Kwan, Jose Ramirez, and Josh Naylor. They had to mix and match after that. I think Stephen Vogt did a tremendous job in every way for the Guardians this year. Yeah, what a successful year for them. And they've got a lot coming actually in the pipeline. They're one of the better teams farm system wise. And, you know, according to Baseball America, Tim, this was awesome as always. Thank you for joining us and want to plug the podcast on the way out. Of course, check out Tim on ESPN's coverage, but also check out, is this a great game or what? Uh, We talked about it last time, but just want to give it another little plug here. Tim and his son, Jeff, uh, talking ball, talking about everything, obviously, guests all over the map. So, Uh, Tim, thank you so much. Appreciate it again. Everyone obviously can find this wherever they get their pods. All right, fellas. Thanks a lot. Nice to see you. Good to see you too. Enjoy the series. Tim Kirkjian with us um, on FT. It's going to be awesome, like Tim mentioned. Hey, everybody. Be sure to like and subscribe for more content. We're back here every weekday, all year long, so do not miss an episode. The videos are coming in all day. Here's another video you might enjoy. Baseball the way it should be covered.